how's everybody doing today it's good to see you looks like we've got a pretty decent crowd starting up hello 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 welcome to class everyone how are you doing good morning Riley C good morning to everybody I hope you can hear me the sound is coming through pretty well today yep looks like my microphones working good deal okay nice somebody's taking Spanish professor Wow fancioso hello Gita good to see you yes we are gonna finish Tuesday's lecture uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about attachments my goal is to talk about attachment for 15 minutes to talk about uh, cognitive Piaget's theory of cognitive development for 15 minutes and then to talk about uh, Eric Erickson for 15 minutes okay Good deal. All right. It's good to see everybody. Gita and Gaeta. All right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about attachment theory. We'll talk about John Piaget's theory of cognitive development and Eric Erickson's theory of personality development. So we're talking about developmental psychology today, and there are three areas of research that are fundamental in the field of developmental psychology. We're going to talk about Mary Ainsworth and attachment theory, uh, absolute giant in the field. We're going to talk about Jean Piaget and how our mind develops. And then we're going to talk about Eric Erickson's theory of personality development, uh, which if my nursing students are any indication, is very popular in the nursing school. So we're going to talk about these three theories today. Okay. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just type them in the chat bar and I will answer them as I see them. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about attachment. If you remember, I talked uh, uh, about human beings developing along three dimensions, biological development, cognitive development, and socio-emotional development. One of the fundamental theories of socio-emotional development in the field of psych developmental psychology is the theory of attachment. All right. Now, here's the deal. Uh, human beings and other mammals are born pretty helpless, so they need support from their primary caregiver. And so evolution has created sort of this desire to this innate desire to uh, bond with the primary caregiver uh, that occurs during the first uh, period of, an, of a mammal's life. And this attachment allows the, uh, allows the developing organism to get the sustenance it needs and also to manage anxiety and fear and begin the exploratory behavior that is n a normal part of development. So remember, brains have to be stimulated in order to grow and develop. Um, mammals, little mammals, are uh, have to manage their anxiety and fear uh, as they decide to explore in the world and learn. If they're afraid, they don't do the exploring behavior and the brain doesn't develop. So today we're going to talk about this fundamental human need uh, called attachment. And it's the close bond that develops between an infant and a primary caregiver during the first years of life. Uh, quick question, Ed is saying hello, it's good to you. What do you mean by being taught at other levels of education, uh, Camille? Uh, typically, I've taught college classes. I have taught senior level classes, um, a senior level research class, and here I just teach uh, introductory level classes because this is uh, Wake Tech is an introductory level class. High school or middle? No, I have never been in the high school or middle school uh, ranks. Why do you ask? And I'll, I'll talk as I take your answer. Now, uh, one of the first people persons to identify this relationship was a fairy, fellow named Harry Harlow uh, uh, who, who was interested in the question, why do infants bond with their primary caregiver? Back in the 1940s, this school of psychology had developed called behaviorism. Remember I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago and it is on your midterm. All right. And the behaviorist thought that all behavior resulted from either from being re reinforced from rewards. They thought that people did things because those behaviors led to reinforcements or rewards. And so the early belief was that human babies bonded to their primary caregiver because their primary caregiver gave them food. And so when you ask the question, why do mommies, why do babies love their mommies? 
the, uh, st- the, the explanation that would have been given to you in the 30s was that mommies provide food. But uh, this guy, Harry Harlow, thought that there was something else that was important in the relationship. So he set up this really crazy experiment to test whether or not babies bond to their mother because of food or because of something else. If you look at the picture I have down here in the corner, the other corner right down there, you'll see these uh, little bitty baby monkey and you'll see Harry Harlow. And you're going to notice that there are two sort of... Uh, uh, I don't know which, robotic mothers. Now, what he did was he took these little capuchin monkeys away from their mom the day they were born, and he put them in cages all alone. And in these cages, he had two uh, wire monkey mothers, if you will. But if you'll see, the monkey mother on the left was covered with soft, furry uh, blanket that was kind of nice and snuggly. The other mother, uh, the other mother, Uh, props. Yeah, that's a good word, uh, Chris. The other mother uh, didn't have the soft, warm covering, but the other mother had the bottle. Okay? So, and they wanted to see which mother would the monkey spend his or her time with. And what they found was that monkeys spent less than one hour a day with the wire mother uh, feeding. And the other 23 and a half hours a day, the baby would spend uh, uh, hugging the soft mother monkey. Now, he did these experiments where he would come in and he would scare these little monkeys to see which mother they would run to when they were afraid. And he found that these little monkeys, when they were scared, they never ran to the, uh, to the mother that fed them. They ran to the mother that was soft and cuddly. And so what he suggested was that babies attached to their primary caregiver, not because their primary giver, caregiver feeds them, but because their primary caregiver uh, gives them, uh, gives them uh, uh, some sort of creature comfort, if you will. And uh, he began to develop the theory that the uh, mam- mammal or person minimizes the impact of negative emotional states, fear, Uh, by snuggling on the soft, uh, warm mother. And so he began to believe that really the bond between a primary caregiver and a parent was not due to food, but it was due to the need for security. I know poor monkeys. Chris brings up a good point. The weird thing was these monkeys were uh, were messed up. Even though they had food and they had this soft cloth monkey, uh, cloth monkey, they were really um, uh, they did not develop the ability to bond like the other monkeys did. And I've got some videotapes that I can send to people if they're interesting, showing the whole course of these experiments. And these monkeys were unable to function around the other baby monkeys. Uh, if you look at the video, what you find is when they're put in a cage with a bunch of other monkeys, instead of playing with the other uh, baby monkeys, they went over in a corner and they would cover their head and rock back and forth because they were so terrified of the other monkeys. And I will send that to you, Etta, if you're interested. Actually, I think it's in your uh, core... I think it's in the uh, course resources folder, but I'll definitely send it to you. Yeah, so these monkeys were absolutely terribly messed up, Nicole. It was very, very sad. Um, And it turns out there's always gossip about psychologists, and rumor has it that uh, Harry Harlow was a cold, heartless father as well. Seems like most psychologists study their blind spot. So he was studying the warm, comfy relationship between parents and primary caregiver, between primary caregivers and kids, and he was actually a crappy parent. Okay, now here's the thing. So he uh, identified this very important bond uh, between the primary and caregiver and the, uh, the the developing baby. And in fact, you can say that there is a critical period for this attachment. If the baby doesn't get these attachment needs met during the first year, they may develop what clinical psychologists call an attachment disorder. And there are people who do that, who just can't seem to bond and fall into intimate relationships with other people. It's a clinically diagnosed disorder called uh, attachment disorder. Okay, And so there are big implications for the quality of this relationship between the primary caregiver and the mom. Now, uh, a lady named uh, Mary Ainsworth was interested in whether or not there were different patterns of this relationship 
in children and whether or not these different patterns of bonding with the primary caregiver affected the children's outcomes later in life. Now, if you've ever been around a one-year-old or an eight-month or a nine-month or a 14-month-old baby, you're going to notice that these children have two very normal fears uh, that all children have to some degree. And it's always funny when I meet a parent with a toddler baby, and that toddler baby always freaks out when they see the stranger, Chris. Parents usually get very embarrassed because they think that their baby is doing something rude or mean by being afraid of the stranger but it's actually a very, very normal part of the developmental process. Now, prior to six months of age, you can take a little baby and pass them around like a bag of potato chips, and that little baby will love being held by everybody. Take that same baby about three months later, nine, ten months later, and that baby suddenly develops this irrational fear of strange people. And whenever a strange person comes around, you'll see that little toddler run over there and hide behind their mother or get close to their mom or hold on to their mom's uh, legs. And that's what's called stranger anxiety. And it is a very normal part of the attachment process. The deal is about six or seven months, the baby begins to develop the cognitive capacity to to recognize their parent compared to other people, and they develop this preference for their parent because their parent makes them fear, feel secure, and they don't know about other people, so they're afraid of them. So this uh, stranger anxiety is a very normal part of the attachment process. A second other anxiety that kids will get is what's called separation anxiety. If you've ever seen a little toddler, they love to stay close to their mommy or daddy. And if one of their parents gets up and leaves the room and leaves a toddler in the room, you know what kids will do? They'll start crying. This is called separation protest, and it comes from separation anxiety. The kid freaks out when the mom's away. Now, the weird thing is um, these fears develop in infants because they're afraid of strange things and they don't have the ability to self-soothe themselves and they don't understand these scary events. And so what happens is the mom being there, the primary caregiver being there, helps reduce the level of anxiety. And when an organism is scared, an organism won't explore. An organism runs and hides. And so the idea is the mom or primary caregiver, excuse me, I'm being sexy here. The primary caregiver creates a safe base from which the kid can explore and then reattach whenever they're uh, scared. And so if you've ever been around a little baby, what you'll notice is little babies that are crawling, they'll crawl all over the room, but they're always looking at their primary caregiver. And it's like they're almost on a rubber band leash. They'll crawl away from their parent, primary caregiver and explore, and then they'll come back and reestablish contact. And then they'll go out and they'll reestablish contact, and then they'll uh, come back. And sort of this attachment provides the security for the child so they don't get overwhelmed by fear and they can explore and stimulate their little brains, right? And so Mary wanted to see, uh, Dr. Ainsworth wanted to see if there were differences in children's attachment styles. So she created this, she created this experiment, uh, she created this experiment called the Strange Situation uh, uh, Experiment. Uh, hold on just a second. Kircho's having a little trouble. Um, uh, I'm looking at my CPU usage, and it doesn't look like I should be. Uh, I should be, uh, and my internet connection's excellent, so it might be you, Michael. I'm sorry. Um, so she did this. She invented this really cool experiment called the Strange Situation Experiment, for which she is very, very famous. And what she did is she set up an experiment where the child would be left alone by the primary caregiver and alone with a stranger. And what she was interested in doing was seeing how easily the child uh, reestablishes contact. Now, if you folks have ever taken a loved one to the airport to travel away, what's the last thing you do before your person goes through baggage check? You give them a hug. You establish that contact. Then your loved one goes off and flies to wherever in the hell they have to go for work or vacation or whatnot. And when they come back, you meet them at the airport. What's the first thing you do when that person gets off the plane and comes through the security gate? You reestablish 
contact and attachment by giving them a hug. And that's sort of like reestablishing that contact. So what she did was she set up an experiment where children would be separated from their primary caregiver, and then she wanted to see if they were able to reestablish contact with the primary caregiver when they when the primary caregiver comes back in the room. So here's how the uh, hug time, you got it Riley C. So here's how the experiment was set up. The mom and the baby come into a room and they play. Mom sits in a chair while the baby's playing. And this was back in the 60s, so it was primarily mom, so I'm not being sexist now. But the mom would sit in the room and the baby would play around. And then what would happen is the mom would get up and leave the room, okay? And then uh, the baby, of course, starts crying. And then after a few minutes, the mom comes back into the room with the baby. And then a few minutes later, a stranger comes in the room. And then the mom gets up and leaves the baby alone with the stranger. And then after a few minutes, comes back in again. And the important part of this experiment is when the mom comes back in the room. And the question is, how easily is the baby able to establish con uh, attachment and become comforted? Because the one thing all these babies did when the mom left the room is they cried, especially when they were left alone with the stranger. And what she found was that there were three broad patterns in how children responded to this separation when, uh, when they were asked to reattach. About 50% of the children would crawl over to mom, hug her, and stop crying almost immediately. They would collect their emotions and go back to normal. And then these little kids would start crawling around and exploring in the environment. She said that these children had what we would call secure attachment. They had a secure attachment. Now, some of these children, on the other hand, when mom would come back in the room, they would come over there and they couldn't stop crying and they would just be super duper clingy to mom. And she suggested that these children were what we call anxious ambivalent children. Okay, anxious children or ambivalent children. A third group of children seemed to be angry at the mom. They wouldn't stop crying, but they wouldn't make eye contact and they would pull away from her. It's almost as if they were punishing mom for leaving the room. And she called these children avoidant. You had 50% were secure, about 20% were avoidant, about 20% were ambivalent, and about 10% didn't really show any pattern. And so she suggested that there are differences is in how children are able to achieve attachment with their primary caregiver. According to her, it all depended upon how easily the primary caregiver met the child's needs. If the child was scared, uh, was the primary caregiver there to meet their needs during the early days of their life? Um, if they were, these children were more likely to develop a secure attachment, whereas if the mom was inconsistent or not there, the children might develop these what we call in, uh, insecure attachment styles. Now, it turns out research has shown that attachment style may predict your adult relationship style. Have any of you ever dated a person who seemed anxious and paranoid whenever you left? They wouldn't want you to go to the grocery store or out with your friends. They were super duper clingy, wanting to know where you were all day, every day. If you've ever dated a person like that, you may have dated somebody with with um, an insecure attachment style called ang uh, ang ambivalence. On the other hand, some of you may have dated somebody that just won't share with you, just won't become intimate, just won't ever rely on you. And this person may have an avoidant relationship child. Exactly. Exactly. They know him. Child still miss mommies. You know, as a general rule, they, they miss that parent that spends the most time with them. And in, uh, at least in uh, United States and probably in Poland, Etta, uh, the mommy does tend to be there more for the child and engage in more early childhood care than the dad. So that's probably makes sense. So I want you to be familiar with the strange situation paradigm, the three attachment styles, and what Harry Harlow found out about uh, uh, monkeys and their need for attachment. Okay? Now, 
second theorist I want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about real big people in just brief periods, and I'm sorry I don't have a ton of time, but we're going to try to go over it. Jean Piaget, on the other hand, was very famous for studying how our minds developed. He was the first person to develop a cognitive theory of uh, development. And so the question he asked was, how does a baby go from knowing nothing, absolutely stinking nothing, to the brilliant abstract thinking people that I see sitting here in front of me in class. How does that happen? And so Jean Piaget was the first person to suggest a theory of how the mind develops. And in your book, you'll see this four four part chart. And I want you to be familiar with this four part chart uh, for the exam. He argued that human minds evolve just like butterflies through four different stages. So the difference isn't between an eight-year-old and a two-year-old is not that an eight-year-old has more knowledge. It's that they think completely differently than a two-year-old. So imagine, uh, you know, butterflies. They start as a caterpillar, they go into a pupa, and then they come out as a butterfly. And they look completely different each time. He is, his theory was that our mind evolved through four stages, just like this butterfly. And we had different abilities and limitations in each of these stages. All right. And so what I want you to do is to be familiar with the order of these four stages. Uh, it will be important for you this wink weekend, wink, wink, neuromatrix, uh, for you to know these stages of, of cognitive development. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? Okay. So he argued that these stages go this way from the first from the time you're born to the first two years, you're in what we call the sensory motor period. From age two to around age six, when you go off to school, you're in the pre-operational period. From about six or seven until about 12 or 13, you're in the cognitive operational uh, period. And then around 13 or 14, you, you, your brain changes again and you go into what he would call the formal operational uh, period. And he argued that each of these stages has different abilities and limitations. So for example, he argued in the first two years of your life, children are pre-symbolic. What he meant by pre-symbolic was he meant that they didn't have the ability to think about things abstractly, okay? So I can't imagine my mom unless she's standing right in front of me. I don't know my name. I can't talk. I don't have any of these symbolic abilities in my head. So think of the baby as being pre-symbolic. And what they're doing is they're learning how to act intentionally in the world and understand the link between their sensory experiences and their motor behaviors, okay? So if any of you watched the video about to walk I showed you, uh, I sent to you yesterday or came to my uh came to my, uh, 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 let's see, did we do that in this class? No, that's in my other class. I'm sorry, it's in my developmental psych class. Um, they're pretty symbolic. You learn how to act intentionally in the world. So what he found was that children during this age show some things that suggest that they, uh, they, uh, that, uh, do, 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 that suggests that they don't have the ability to think about things symbolically in their brain. And uh, there will be one question on the last slide in the 4A PowerPoint on cognitive development in older adulthood. And basically what you need to know it, uh, for that chart, uh, Leanne, is that, uh, is, that, um, um, is that when we get older, our mind gets less flexible but we still know what we know. So crystallized knowledge doesn't change. But as an older guy, my flexibility, my brain isn't as flexible as yours. And I don't think as quickly as yours. But we'll, let's, let's carry on without that. Now, how did he know this? He found that children failed, in, that young children failed two particular tasks. The first was called object permanence. And the second was called objective self-awareness. And both of these suggest that the child doesn't have the ability to think about things in their brain unless they're actually looking at them. So object permanence, he would show a kid a toy, right? Uh, you show a seven month old a toy 
and then hide it in a blanket right in front of them. And what you'll find is that your child doesn't go looking for the object that you hid right in front of them. It's almost as if the kid will start looking around and forget that you ever showed them the object. And he suggested that children don't have object permanence. Now, I'm sure none of you can see your car right now, but you know that your car still exists. You have the ability for object permanence. What he found was when he showed kids a toy that they wanted and they would grab at it and then he would take it and put it right under a little cloth right in front of them, the children would just forget all about it. And so he suggested that they did this because they did not have object permanence. Out of sight means out of mind. Okay? On the second task that he showed that demonstrated that children didn't have the ability to uh, keep things in their mind was what he called objective self-awareness. Objective self-awareness is knowing that you are an object. So I know that Chris is an object. When I'm sitting here looking at the screen right now and I see that dude up in the corner with the gray shirt on, I know who that is. That's me because I have objective self-awareness. Now what they do is they use this smudge test on a kid to demonstrate that children before about 15 to 16 months of age don't really think of themselves as an object. So in the smudge test, what they do is, while the kid's not really paying attention, they smudge some uh, a red color, some sort of color on the kid's forehead. And then they put the kid in front of a mirror. And what you'll find is that before the age of 15 months, hi, how are you doing? Come on in and say hello. How are you? Holy cow, folks. <laughs> the department head is here to visit, uh, and I just wanted you to say hello to her. Let's see. Here we go. Hi, folks. Where are you? At the there. Beach? Hi. How are you doing? I'm this, Tori. This is Tori Rohde. She's the, the uh, department head here. She is the best boss in the entire <laughs> world. Thank you. Thank cool. You. We're sitting here talking about uh, Piaget right now in cognitive development. Very I've got cool. some students asking lots of questions. Hi, Tori. That's Riley C., Chris Figueroa, Gerald McGrath, so cool. Nicole Ortiz, all my students. All right. Well, enjoy. Thank you very much. Good to see you. All right. Back to work now. <laughs> she says hello. She's super awesome. Super awesome. Lady. Holy cow. Bye. Bye. Now that I can, she's going, I can tell you she really is an awesome boss. I could not be happier uh, than to have her as my leader. Okay. Nice brown. <laughs> Back to the party. Right. And so the deal is before about 15 months, kids will just look at the uh, uh, look at themselves in the mirror and they don't do anything. But after about 15 months of age, what he found was that kids will start doing this when they look at themselves in the mirror. And what does this mean? This means that they know that that object that they're looking at is actually them in the mirror. And the crazy thing is, uh, some lower mammals, uh, and not all apes can do this. They have tried this experiment with apes, and some apes are not able to engage in self-awareness. Okay? It is always a party in here. Whoop, whoop. All right, so that's what we call the sensory motor period. So children in this age just don't have the ability to think of things uh, in terms of symbols. And if you think about it, language begins to develop during the second year, and language is the use of symbols. So symbolic ability uh, then develops. Yeah, some of the smarter animals with the bigger wrinkled brains, Gerald, have that objective self-awareness. We used to think it was only humans because we're arrogant that way. Not so true. Not so true. Now, the second stage, uh, how many of you still believe in Santa Claus? Going to bring you some presents. Woo, woo. Here's a story. This dude flies around the world in a sled pulled by these deer, and he has all the presents in the world for everybody, and he drops them down your fireplace, and he does this all in one night. Isn't that the stupidest explanation, stupidest story you ever heard? That is just logically impossible. And you know what? All four-year-olds fall for that stupid story. All children here in America believe that some bunny hops down, uh, hops to your house uh, and hides eggs and gives you a basket of candy in April. Um, my parents told me that some that if I put my tooth underneath my pillow and went to sleep at night, the tooth fairy would bring me money. And kid believe. <laughs> Kids believe those silly freaking ideas. And it's because children are symbolic 
but not logical. And if you've ever seen four or five year olds play, they love to play pretend. They're gonna be a fire person or a police person or they might play house, you be mommy, I'll be dad, and we'll make the little brother baby, right? And we'll, and we'll torture him. Children from two to six are what we call symbolic, but not logical. And we call it pre-operational because he thought an operation was a logical piece of thinking. So pre-operational means pre-logical. And what he found was that children made very uh, non-logical mistakes when they were given conservation tasks. Okay, and so a conservation task is when you show a child something from one perspective and then change the perspective and see if the child's smart enough to know that nothing has changed just because it looks different. And he found that children failed these conservation tasks from two to about the age of six. I sent a video link earlier today and it's also in your course resources folder and it shows you some four and some eight year old children playing these conservation tasks. And what you'll find is the, uh, is you'll find that uh, if, if you look at that video, you'll see that the four and five year olds uh, don't seem to understand that just because you pour a glass of water into a different shaped glass, it's not the same amount of water. So he would pour a short fat glass of water into a tall skinny glass glass, same amount of water, and he would ask the kid, is it the same or a different amount? And what he found was that pre-operational kids would look at the tall glass and say, oh, it's taller, there must be more water in there. And that's what we would call uh, a, a failure of a <laughs> Starbucks. Right, Nicole? Here you go, you wanted a large coffee? Shh. They pour the same amount of coffee into a big glass, right? You folks wouldn't Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about, Chris. If you'll go up in the chat bar and look at the link I'll show you, they show a little four-year-old girl two rows of five quarters that are the same length. Okay, and they ask her, are they the same or the different amount of quarters? And the girl goes, oh, it's the same number of quarters. She can't quite count them, but she, uh, she knows they're the same amount of quarters. They then take the bottom row and spread it out. Same amount of quarters, but now it's a longer line. And the little girl points at that and says, that's more quarters. So he found that children are very uh, illogical at this page. So we all go through this symbolic but not logical period. Now, the third stage, uh, starting around the time you go to school, and if it, it probably this is why they decided to start school around f six, five or six, when uh, school was invented. Children now become logical. Piaget found that six and seven year olds never failed the conservation task. You couldn't trick them, just like I couldn't trick you, Nicole. If I took your small $4 coffee and poured it into the $6 cup and charged you six bucks, you'd be like, oh no, uh uh, you're screwing me over. I'm not giving you six bucks. That's just the same amount of coffee in a bigger glass. He found that starting around six or seven, you couldn't fool kids like that. They were very, very logical. But he found that these kids were not very good at abstract thinking. All right. Now, early childhood educators, if any of you are going to become an early childhood educator, uh, you need to know this. Children learn best when you show them things and they can touch things. And he found that children this, uh, at this age were logical, but only for things that were symbolic I mean, that were uh, familiar to them or were concrete. So children could reason if they could see things and touch things. But if you ask them to think abstractly, these seven and eight year olds couldn't figure it out. And so he argued that children were in what we would call the concrete operational period. They were logical, but you had to show them things and let them see things. And if any of you are going to become uh, an early childhood educator, what they're going to tell you is that you, if you're going to teach them about the solar system, you have to get the styrofoam balls so that the kids can see the styrofoam balls. If you're going to teach the kids about the U.S. Congress, you can't talk about freedom and liberty. Those are abstract concepts. Instead, we all have to dress up and do a constitutional uh, convention, right? I'll be Patrick Henry, you be George Washington, you be Ben Franklin. And if you've ever seen uh, at museums, they always have kid zones. And you know what the kid zones are? They're for the concrete operational kids, the early childhood kids that can go and play with things and touch things, right? Because they're logical, 
but it's a new ability, so they're not really good at using it in unfamiliar or in abstract senses. Now, all of you folks should be in what we would call the formal operational period, where you are abstract and logical. Okay, and he argued that you could engage in hypothetico deductive reasoning, and that is figuring out what might happen if you do this. I remember when I was nine years old, me and my buddies used to play baseball in this tennis court right beside these apartments. These apartments were right in the back of the field so that sometimes you could hit the rubber ball. And if you hit it hard enough, the tennis ball would go out of the court and bounce off the uh, bounce off the uh, the apartment building. It was so much fun. Uh, no, Chris, I would say that the fundamental nature of abstract reasoning is that it is logical. So abstract silliness, maybe. Um, right. Well, here's the thing. Leanne points out a good point. Abstract reasoning is tougher than concrete reasoning. So if given the opportunity, most of you would prefer to engage in concrete reasoning. But you're old enough, and so we force you to think abstractly. In fact, I like to think of college as an abstract reasoning practice zone, where I'm forcing you to think abstractly. And I don't like the teachers, honestly, that play games in college classrooms. Even though those games are useful, I think that what we're trying to do is to train you to think abstractly. So hands-on educational practices in college, a lot of times the games and the silliness things that they do, uh, uh, I think are a little immature and not appropriate for college as much as they are for uh, the middle school areas. Does that make sense? Um, and so when I was playing t uh, baseball, one day we decided to bring a hard baseball, a real baseball, and play uh, baseball in that tennis court that backed right up to the apartment complex. Can anybody tell me why this is a bad idea? <laughs> All right, Keelan. Yeah, I know it's a game, but I had to do a little bit. I knew as soon as I said that, I knew somebody was going to poke me for that. Uh, Touche, Keelan. Right? So, what do you think happened when we were playing hardball baseball? Uh, right there on a tennis court backed up against an apartment complex. Somebody hit a home run and we went right up into that apartment complex and busted a window. You, you know it, Leanne. And what do you think we all did? We ran, baby. We took off. Absolutely, baby. You weren't going to catch me. And now, if I had talked to my dad, if my dad had found found out this, he would have asked me, he would have said, Chris, didn't you realize what was going to happen? And my answer as a nine-year-old was, nope, dad, I did not have hypothetical deductive reasoning abilities. Absolutely. All right, so that's how the mind evolves over uh, our life. And he suggested that what we do is we, uh, we, we have these schemes that start off super duper simple and we build them up and make them more complex through experiments. So a scheme is a set of linked mental reposition that helps you understand and interact successfully with the world. They start with really simple uh, schemes that we learn as kids. If you hear a sound, turn your head and look at it. If there's something in front of you and you want it, reach your arm out and grab it. That's a scheme, if you will. That's a plan of action. And babies start with these really simple schemes like looking at things and then reaching at things. And then they'll put those two schemes together. And if something's over here, I'll look at it, then reach it, right? And so in a sense, Babies take whatever little uh, scheme they have and they make them complex by changing them through environmental experience. So the first thing that children learn to do is suck on a nipple uh, because that's how they feed themselves. But after a while, they and that's a scheme. Sucking on a nipple to get fed is a scheme. But you'll know what that child does uh, after, as they get a little bit older. They start sticking everything in their mouth, right? A pacifier, a block, their fingers, their hands, their toes. And what they're doing is they're trying to see where that scheme will work. So what they're trying to do is to assimilate that scheme. And they find that a pacifier is fun to suck. They find that a finger is fun to suck. 
They find that putting a block in the mouth is pretty fun too. And so what they're doing is they're assimilating that scheme. And then your child might pick up a handful of dirt and put that in their mouth. And that's nasty. And suddenly they say, hey, I can't use that scheme here. I have to change it or accommodate it a little bit. Let me give you an example. Uh, my, the first thing my kid learned to say was doggoo, dog. He said dog because we had a little bitty terrier dog and he would say dog, dog. And that was a scheme that he learned. Now we would take him around to see people and everywhere he saw a four-legged furry animal, he would say dog. He would assimilate that animal. And he began to find that dogs could be big, dogs could be short, Dogs could be hairy, and dogs could have no hair. And so he assimilated all these different objects into his scheme of what a dog was. And then we took him over to my friend's house who was a cat lover. And you know what the first thing he said when he saw that cat? What do you think he said? He said, dog, doggoo. And we all laughed and we said, no, son. It's not a dog, it's a cat, because dogs go woof woof and kitty cats go meow. And so he had to accommodate or change his schema. Instead of saying a schema is a four-legged furry animal, he changed it to say a schema. His scheme was a dog is a fur, four-legged furry animal that goes bark bark. So he had to adjust his scheme. And so if you think about it, every time you learn something new, you are adjusting your scheme to make it more complex and allow you to fit into your environment. You know what? Somebody asked a question about learning earlier, and I saw the chat bar disappear. I forget what that question was. I apologize. Crudola. Um, oh, well. If you, have, if you want to ask that question again, just go ahead and ask it, and I'll answer it. Okay, and so that's sort of cognitive development. Uh, now, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, we talked a little bit about these. Uh, so watch the PJ and demonstrations videos. I've gotten your resources folder so you can see a child uh, demonstrate object permanence or the lack thereof um, and uh, uh, objective self-awareness. And then there are some conservation tasks that I want you to see. One of them's up in the chat bar that I sent to you at the beginning of lecture. And uh, what he found was that children had trouble conserving number. They had trouble conserving volume. They had trouble conserving size. They weren't logical during the pre-operational period, okay? And so the main criticism of Piaget is that, uh, well, actually, there are two criticisms. The first is that children sometimes can do things before he said they can do them. And uh, the second thing, he didn't put much stock in social interaction. He thought this all happened automatically. It just evolved out of your body. So I'd like for you to be familiar. Where do they learn to do? But I know the answer. They just adjust the scheme over time. Sweet. Okay, then the lecture actually helped a little bit. All right, fine. I know I'm running out of time, but please stay with me. Please stay with me for a little bit longer. Okay, I noticed that we're down to 24 uh, viewers right now. Please stay with me. So Eric Erickson is important for a different reason. He had a theory of how our personality develops. So how do you grow up and gain wisdom? Because you know that two-year-olds are kind of selfish. Six-year-olds can be a little selfish. Eighteen-year-olds can be a little selfish. But we change over time and we develop our personalities. Piaget uh, was interested in this development. And he was what we call an ego psychologist. He argued that most people spend their time thinking about and trying to develop this thing called an identity. And I guarantee you, lots of you probably spend your time thinking he thinks it's a different baby. Yes. Yes, um, actually the, uh, Je oh God, Jessica, is it Jessica? I've forgotten. Uh, yes, uh, Jessica, um, they do. If you, sometimes they'll point and go, who's that? Uh, uh, and it's because, Jesse, it's because they don't know that they're looking at themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to see this. If you're a nurse and you walk into a, 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 a patient's room, based on their age, they're going to have a different kind of thing that's important to them. Um, and so this, rep this can be represented by Eric Erickson's theory of personality development, where he argues that human beings go through eight stages of personality development. In each one of these stages, 
We have to, we have to resolve a crisis or learn a lesson. Don't think of crisis as a bad thing. We all have to learn a lesson or solve a task is what he would say. And these tasks happen at typical times of our life. And each of these involves a different relationship with a group of people, and we have to learn these lessons. Now, he argues that if you solve these lessons, you develop a personality, which is a good personality, uh, a, a, a quality personality trait. He called this a virtue, if you will. Now, some people don't, and this actually impairs their personality because he thought that in order to build on e each personality level, built on the other levels. And so he argued that in each of these stages, we have to uh, exactly an existential crisis. You know what? You go through your existential crises in middle adulthood and old age when you try to figure out, does my life matter? All of you are 18 year olds. You haven't had to come to terms with this, but at some point you're going to say, crap. Is my life really mattering or am I just wasting my time? An existential crisis by Leanne. And so we suggested that we all go through these different ages. And on the test, I may even ask you about, uh, on the Neuromatrix and the quiz, I'm going to ask you to know uh, what people's stages are they're going through based upon their age. Okay? There you go, 18 and 31. It happens. It happens. So in infancy, he argued that our crisis was wondering if we could trust the world. So the big crisis was trust versus mistrust. And children can learn the world that is safe and reliable and that people are loving and reliable. And so you want to go on the sense of trust. Now, here's the deal. He found that you can go too far to the good, too. So if you have too much trust, you become a sucker and people can take advantage of you. So he argued that while we want to develop the trust, we have to have the capacity to understand what distrust is too. And if the baby is taken care of and mom and dad really give that baby what it needs, it'll develop uh, the virtue of hope, which is the belief that things can turn out well. Now, toddlers are up and walking and moving around, and they're developing a sense of autonomy. And he argued that during this period, kids are de dealing with a crisis of autonomy versus shame and doubt. So your kid wants to have a sense of, of autonomy and walk around and do things, but they're also learning this word no, that some things they shouldn't do, right? And so what he argued is you want to give your kid a little bit of self-control, but at the same time, you want them to develop a sense of autonomy, a sense of being able to uh, explore the environment, a sense of confidence, if you will. Now, um, uh, and that's usually with the primary caregiver. Now, as you get a little bit older, from four to six, you go through a third a crisis called initiative versus guilt. And this occurs around your family. Kids at four and five and six years old have to learn how to take turns. I want to turn, but I also have to give Billy and Susie a turn as well. Now, me wanting to take a turn is developing a sense of initiative. Look, Daddy, I did this. Look, Mommy, I did this. Your four and six-year-olds are going to love to say that. And because they want to do something on their own, they want to show initiative. But at the same time, you have to teach your child how to give somebody else a turn too, right? Now, some kids, if you make your kid feel really, if your kid doesn't have a sense of autonomy and your kid doesn't have a sense of trust, they might feel unable to take a chance to take their opportunity. They might uh, be shy about taking their turn. So what he wants you to develop is a sense of initiative taking a turn while still having enough guilt, if you will, to let somebody else take a turn, to know how to share with people. Ex they do. They do. They want to do something, initiate something, and have mom and dad validate that, Riley. See, that's a good way to think about it. Now, from 7 to 10, you go to school. And that's the first time where you learn that you can do something that's not good, right? Your teacher's job is to tell you when you're doing something right or when you're doing something wrong and you're comparing yourself to all your student friends. Is my picture as pretty as the other kid's picture? Can I hop up and down as good as the other students? Can I read as good as the other students? And you're learning a sense of industry, how to do something 
good. Some Well, and some people still don't like sharing. And uh, I would tell you that Erickson would say it's because they did not resolve that uh, that crisis in uh, early childhood, uh, Riley. They didn't have to share with other people. And it's a personality flaw, if you will. Now, when you go into school, you have to learn how to do something good. Uh, and... You know, you learn what we call a sense of industry versus inferiority. Now, if people tell you everything you do sucks, you'll develop feelings of inferiority. Some of you may feel inferior. Some of you may have known somebody who has inferiority feelings, right? On the other hand, you have to learn how to be good at something, and we all want to learn how to do something good. And if you learn how to be good at school, it gives you a sense of industry. Uh, there you go. So you might have, you might not have gotten enough uh, uh, initiative uh, Keelan, maybe you tend towards the other side of the dimension, uh, and that 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 can be a difficulty as well. And so he argued that we have to learn how to make something good. Now here's the deal: while we have to learn how to be good at something, we all also have to learn how to have the confidence to suck at something too, right? Anytime you learn something new, you're not very good at it. And so some people, he argued, have what we call narrow virtuosity. They find that they're good at something and that's all they do. And they don't do other things that they're not good of. He's good at. He would say that's not good either. You not only have to learn how to be good at something, but you have to have the confidence to learn how to suck at something. Because anytime you learn something new, you're not going to be good at it, right? So in a sense, you have to learn how to have the confidence in the ability to learn something and be good at it, but you also have the willingness to try things that maybe you're not good at. And one of the things I find with students a lot of times is they tend to be afraid to do something that they're not good at because they think that I'm or somebody else is going to invalidate them as a human being. We're all afraid of sucking at something, but you have to develop the confidence to do that, right? Okay. There you go, Leanne, some trust issues as well. And we talked about it in class the other night, and I can understand why you uh, might want to keep that book closed. That would be completely normal, right? All right. Now, most of you are in uh, the fifth stage of personality development, identity versus role confusion. Who am I politically? Who am I sexually? Who am I as an individual? In the teenage years, you start separating out from your parents. You're totally happy as a child being Mr. and Mrs. Roddenberry's kid, but we all get to that point in our life where we want to break away and form our own identity. And he argued we go through this stage called identity versus role confusion. Now, some people, uh, we all want to develop a sense of identity, who I am as a person, but he argued some people uh, can't. Some people develop such a strong sense of identity that they become fanatics and think everybody ought to live just like them. That's having too strong an identity. On the other hand, some people refuse to grow up and get a job and they don't want to try to get a career and they don't want to do anything and they're kind of stuck in the everlasting world of Peter Pan. I don't know if any of you have ever seen somebody who's a grown-up 25 or 30 still kind of at mom and dad's house not really going out trying to start their own life. This is a person who is stuck in what we might call the role confusion. They're afraid to take an identity because an identity is just, uh, it's a fake, uh, it's, it's a statement of who I am. My, I, I call myself a psych teacher, but there's nothing biological that makes me a psych teacher. It's just an identity that I have developed in my head, right? And each and every one of you has to develop an idea of what you are. And it's freaking scary, I'll tell you as an 18, because I wanted to be a psychology psychologist, but I didn't quite feel like it. So you have to learn how to develop a sense of identity, right? So we develop a sense of trust, a sense of autonomy, a sense of initiative, a sense of industry, and all of these things, if they're in place, help us develop a healthy sense of identity, okay? A sense of being an individual. But as soon as you develop a sense of identity, of being individual, we all need to find a group to now become intimate with as an adult identity. Most of us are looking for some sort of romantic attraction, and the reason that it becomes so important during the 20s is because we're all looking for a sense of intimacy. Now, it doesn't have to come 
necessarily from just a romantic partner, but we all have to find a sense of groupness, a group, a gang, a, a, a community where we fit in. And you know what? I find that a lot of people, like, I, I hate to trivialize it, but when I look at those school shooters and people who engage in mass murder, I find that I think these people have trouble, trouble developing their identity as an adult. And so this isolation that they feel this uh, isolation that they feel drives them to do something. It, it creates in them such a sense of anger and frustration that they act out on it. But we're all looking for a sense of a friend squad as Leanne. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a heterosexual romantic relationship. It can be a homosexual relationship. It can be a group relationship. It can be platonic. We all just need a friend squad. Absa stinking lootly, Jesse. We all need a friend squad. If we do, we develop a sense of intimacy or we can develop a sense of isolation. Now, here's the problem. Uh, we all develop this sense of identity. I'm a psychologist and I'm married to a woman, so I have this, this married life. Right now I have kids. Here's the thing. At some point, you wake up as a 40 or I'm a 50-year-old guy and you say, wow, what about me, the individual? And so what you have to do when you grow up and have a family is you have to balance taking care of other people with taking care of yourself, right? And so I spend a lot of my time taking care of my wife, not taking care of her, but cooperating with her and taking care of my children. And sometimes I feel like I don't have any me time. If you're a, a, a homemaker and you stay home and you take care of of all the kids and you don't have a career, you may start to feel like you don't exist anymore except by virtue of these relationships. And you have a feeling of overextension, if you will. Exactly, Etta, we go through that middle midlife crisis and it's like, what about me? And so we all want to have this sense of generativity, which is uh, building the world, okay, and helping everybody else. But at the same time, we also uh, need to take a little time for ourselves and be an individual. And so we're balancing generativity versus stagnation. Now, some people grow up and they spend their life focusing on nothing but their careers and nothing but them. And me, 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 me. And these people, a lot of times when they get up into their 40s, their existential crisis, their midlife crisis is I don't have anything uh I don't have a legacy, okay? And so sometimes you can be iso you can be self-absorbed and stagnated, and you can uh, your existential crisis comes in the fact that you might say, "I don't have a legacy." All right, that's one way. On the other hand, I have a legacy because I got kids and a family, and I teach all you people, and I'm a college professor and whatnot. But sometimes I feel like, what about Chris, man? What about the guy who just wants to run around and buy a, a BMX motocross bike or something like that, right? And so we have to balance between, uh, so some people feel like they, I don't have me. I've lost my sense of me. They may go back to school at 40s. They may divorce their wife or husband and set out on their own, and they're having this midlife crisis, abso freaking lootly. And the test will be on Blackboard starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All right, a couple more minutes and then we're done. Now, here's the deal. At some point, we all uh, get to the end of our life. And you know what? When you get to your, the end of your life, you realize that you only get one trip at this. And so suddenly you start asking your questions, man, did I do it right? Did I waste my life? And it may seem silly to you 18 year olds, but at some point you're going to ask yourself, was my life a waste of time? What you do is you're going through the eighth stage called integrity versus despair. When we're trying to see if we really lived a valuable life. And he argued that some people People can look back on their life and they had a good sense of identity and they had a good sense of identity intimacy but they also had their own individuality they built a legacy but they also did what they want these people that can look back on their life with a sense of accomplishment develop what we might call ego integrity 
But you know what? Some people don't. Some people uh, look back on their life and see that they missed out. They didn't fulfill all of their life. And so some of you, I'm going to tell you that getting a career is absolutely important. But you know what? Finding a partner to be with is also important, right? You have to do all of these things. And you have to build a community, but you also have to take care of yourself. So you have to do all of these different things in order to be happy. Just having a career is not going to make you a happy person. I promise, I promise, I promise. Just getting married and finding the right man or the right woman is not going to make you a happy person at the end of your life. Instead, in order to really have ego identity, ego integrity, you have to have a full life. And so he argued that at this age, we can either develop a sense of ego integrity or we start to feel despair because we realize our life is over and we didn't do all that stuff. Okay? So, in a sense, do you kind of see how he argues that our personality develops over uh, our lifespan? And it's each of these tasks. Now, for the exam, I'm just going to want you to be familiar with what happens during each of these stages. So, what's happening during uh, young adulthood? Well, it's intimacy versus isol isolation. What's happening during uh, the teenage years? Well, I'm trying to develop a sense of identity. So, I'm going to have these questions on the neuromatrix and also on the uh, and on the uh, uh, exam for uh, I'm going to expect you to kind of know what the broad crises are for these uh, you know what probably at least for stage one and then the stages five through eight is usually what I ask questions on. I usually don't ask about the toddler, the preschool, or childhood ages. But I want you to be able to attach these different ages with the uh, crisis that is occurring. Does that make sense? All right, last thing. Uh, please watch those conservation videos as they may also be important for the Neuromatrix contest. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for listening to me for a whole hour. I am so sorry for taking this much of your time up. I was just uh, running behind because of Tuesday's lecture. Uh, I promise I will try never to go as long as an hour again. Uh, if anybody doesn't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and log off. If you have a couple of questions, type them in the chat bar and I'll answer them offline. Uh, but other than that, take care and I will see you in the Neuromatrix or at the review session uh, this weekend. Take care.